the form of uh, of realgar or ass. You don't want to be exposed to too much of that. It's time for some more styropyro, specifically fuseless fireworks from the 1940s. So the same time period where people were just figuring out how to make nuclear reactors. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some. When my grandpa passed away, I inherited a lot of his interesting old junk, hmm. like terrifying old pesticides, oh my. ammonia themed trinkets, and this stash of old fireworks. So old interesting junk. That's how you get things like early critical assemblies that sometimes turn into demon cores, radium dial factories, and graphite piles that are basically 1940s Minecraft. These legacy materials often carry an increased risk that modern materials do not have. And that's simply because those safety standards did not exist yet. So things like pre-ASME pressure vessels, pre-NRC reactors, and labs before you had criticality safe. Now some of these old fireworks are pretty interesting because they were made long before any laws were put into place to protect exactly. us from having too much fun. <laughs> For example, these firecrackers are probably way bigger than what's allowed now. I'm sure these are filled with all sorts of restricted chemicals. And a note on the size, it isn't going to scale linearly. <laughs> Whether it be with fireworks or nuclear applications. You can't casually scale up a reactor, an explosive, or a capacitor bank. And even these silver sparklers are banned today. Oh, I'm However, sure. there's one firework in here that really earned its ban. And it's these guys. Notice how these don't have fuses. That's intentional. Yeah. Now, how do you use a firework? That's all kinds of red flag. Makes me think of getting a bare critical assembly without control rods. I mean, after all, a fuse is a delay and control mechanism. So removing it, no, removing the fuse removes any sort of predictable initiation. And there's no separation between the operator and the thing releasing the energy. So is it the fireworks equivalent of the demon core? I mean, where the demon core, the only separation was a screwdriver, maybe. It doesn't have a fuse. Well, the idea behind these things is that you don't need a fuse, as long as you make it out of chemicals that are extremely shock sensitive. <laughs> yeah, that's, mm, that's, I can see the reason why this thing was banned pretty quick. I mean, that's, how the primary explosives work within a nuclear weapon. They are shock sensitive by design. And that's the reason why they're handled under extreme procedural control. So these are closer to detonators than consumer pyrotechnics. It's basically one of these things. Yeah. Except it has about 10,000 times more active ingredient in it. Yeah, that's definitely not a joke. <laughs> Sounds like fun, right? Let's test some of these out. Now, honestly, it kind of sketches me out to even throw something like this. But I mean, it has sat around for like 80 years, so it probably isn't that sensitive. Um, I would tend to go in the other direction with the aged energetic material maybe being less stable, that is to say more sensitive. Same reason why old nuclear materials need to get recertified constantly. And license extensions for old nuclear reactors, it's a rigorous process that requires inspections as well as system upgrades. License extensions are very expensive, though not nearly as expensive as building an entirely new nuclear plant from scratch. But I don't think time makes energetic chemistry safer. Hopefully. All right, here goes nothing. I just love the look on his face, though. <laughs> and yes, the hopefully. Sure. I'm sure he knows the answer. And I'm certain he knows that. He's just having fun. <laughs> All right, sport ball was never my thing, okay? <laughs> Uh, that's fine. I was never much of an athlete either. Uh. <laughs> okay, well, it clearly isn't that sensitive. I'm glad he left that in there. That's, uh, that's very good. Right. Let me try this again.
Yep. Wow. Ooh, that is that is loud. Yeah, that definitely sounded sharper. A concussive crack. Getting into detonation physics here. A bit like saying, oh, I accidentally took it critical. That is that's way bigger than a firecracker, my goodness. Yeah, that's uh yeah, I wouldn't want that going off in my hand. Yikes. <laughs> Yeah, those shockwaves would couple quite efficiently into water-rich tissue. And a reason why shock-sensitive systems are often handled remotely in nuclear plants. My grandpa told me that when he was a kid, he and his friends would pool together money to buy these things in bulk via a, a mail order. And I want to say they would pool together something like a dollar and forty cents to buy a whole crate of these things. Nice. And then once they would arrive, they would uh, they would line their pockets with them and mm. then ride their bicycles around throwing them at stuff. Which, gosh, uh, it sounds like such good innocent fun, you know? It's, uh, it really is a shame that they took these from us. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's going to be some survivorship bias right there, not safety. But hey, back in the day, plenty of early nuclear workers in the 1940s lived long, healthy lives. And then there was a few that didn't make it and went horribly. I'm curious how well a, uh, a slingshot can set these things off. But you know, the more I... Uh... The more I mess with this, it, uh, I don't like how I have to like squeeze, squeeze this <laughs> thing. He keeps doing it. Mmm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if this is a good idea. Oh, that was like a dud hit. Interesting. Probably something to do with these things being ancient and absorbing water, but... I mean, it still sort of went off. Yeah, interesting. But I just think I need to add, if an energetic system requires compression to function, well, your hand is now part of the initiation system. <laughs> which is the same reason why control rods are gravity fed, at least in a pressurized water reactor. You can't have ones be inserted from the bottom, but it uses pressurized nitrogen. Either way, not a person. And reactors are designed to scram or reactor trip automatically. Yeah, that was nothing like the, uh, like the first one. Sure. I really hope that dud was a fluke because I really wanted this slingshot thing to work out. So, uh, so now I'm going to try this again. <laughs> Just loud? Those are so sketchy. I'm sure some of it's a bit different in person versus on a camera that he picks up a lot more of the noise, but you know it's good when he's laughing. Wow. Oh yeah, it, it, left a, it left a dent done. there. Okay, I'll admit, I can see why these things were banned. Instead of throwing these at something, I'm curious... What? <laughs> really? I'm curious whether I can set them off by just like smashing them with an ax. All right, so you're turning the impact sensitivity test in on its head, which is usually done in controlled laboratory environments behind shielding with remote systems, with blast chambers, not some dude holding an ax. Though apparently back in the days of EBR1, control rod was handled with a man with an ax. That's where the term scram comes from, safety control rod ax man. It was a much smaller reactor and this was back in these good old days here, even a bit afterward in the 1950s. But yeah, he's definitely getting into the spirit of things. All right. I really hope- Alright, he's putting on the safety glasses. That's- that's good. Can't tell if he has hearing protection on. Oh, this one goes off. <laughs> yeah, it went off. It wasn't as loud, but- Sure, but I mean that energy's gonna get coupled into the ground. So if less of it in the air, you're gonna get less of the overpressure. Kind of like the difference between doing your nuclear tests air burst versus ground-based or underground. It went off. Okay. I'd rather throw them at stuff, I think. Okay, so the axe wasn't exactly ideal, but Baseball bat. that's more like friction based as opposed to shock based. So I'm hoping with this I can I can set it off. And and I know I said that sport ball isn't my thing, but I'm still gonna try to make it work. There you go. Could always put it on a T. Whoa! Nice one. <laughs> that was some good sport balling. <laughs> That was fun. That was very fun, actually. Now, every time I play with fire in the forest, 
I get all these comments saying that I'm going to burn the forest down. So I have to clarify. The bigger hazard here is going to be shockwaves or a blast, which isn't the same thing as a fire and maybe a noise hazard. Can't, again, I can't quite tell how loud it is on by watching it on a video. By that. Now, this isn't California where, you know, everything just lights and fire by looking at it wrong. No, this mm. is Illinois, and uh, the ground is, is quite uh, quite wet. And in fact, it actually rained just a few hours ago. So no, this forest is not going to catch on fire anytime soon. And honestly, no I doubt these things warns. are even much of a fire hazard to begin with. In fact, let's put that idea to test and see. <laughs> Every one of his tests. Oh my. See how much of a fire hazard they really are. All right, just gonna sprinkle a little bit of this on here. Not much. A just microwave? enough to, uh, to prove a point. Now the miniature version of these things, which are these snap pops here, are seemingly unable to start a fire. Yeah. Now I want to say it's just impossible, sure. but uh, I know the backyard scientist has a good video on just like trying to get those things to start a fire, and, and he can't get it to happen. Now, these are obviously substantially bigger, but I still don't think that they'll actually be able to ignite that. But there's only one way to find out. Oh my. All right, place your bets. No, I don't think so. Here goes nothing. Let's see. No. Nope. Now, again, I, I don't want to uh, assert that it's impossible, but if, if it doesn't ignite that, it's, it's certainly not going to ignite wet leaves in a forest. Why are they using a microwave? I mean, I know he has a bunch of old microwaves laying around. Maybe that's a... The actual name for this kind of firework is called a torpedo. And they were actually one of the most popular types of fireworks back in the day. Now, the funny thing is that the ones I have here are actually really tame because some torpedoes were made way bigger than these. Now, one terrifying fact about these things is that many of them were just filled with arsenic. In the oh, okay. Now we're getting into the early radium dial nuclear materials from back in the day and that people just cared yes it works not about long-term exposure a form of uh, of real gar or ass so that mm, you don't want to be exposed to too much of that means that the uh the, the real risk of these things wasn't like blowing your fingers off although that was a risk it's poison the real risk was uh being an, exposed to just like huge amounts of arsenic via the smoke so yeah that's really sketchy and that's one of the reasons why Modern nuclear safety focuses on airborne contamination and internal dose as well as long-term exposure pathways because people would get sick not immediately from working with this sort of stuff. It would take a while. It's not always the flashy failure mode. Now I should mention that torpedoes bigger than snap pops are still made. It's just that ones of this size were banned in 1966 mm. and now they're limited to 50 milligrams of active ingredient. Which is just how uh, firecrackers are treated now. Just like you have power limits, thermal limits, dose limits. There is probably going to be some conservatism built into that 50 milligram threshold, but that's the additional margin that they want to give you to make sure that you're good. Because when you exceed certain thresholds, no amount of careful handling will guarantee safety. Now at this point in the video, I'd love to scale one of these up into something just terrifying, like like make a huge version of one of them. Mm. And you know what? This would be extremely easy for me. However, I don't think I'm actually allowed to show you that. So instead, let me break out my That's other fair. kind of band firework, the, uh, the silver sparkler. All right, let's find out why these silver sparklers earn their ban. They're gonna light. Gonna be real bright. Oh, oh, geez, those are bright. Yeah. Maybe it has something to do with those uh, those trailing sparks. Now, I, I don't actually know exactly what got these things banned, but uh, I think it has something to do with how they're fueled by titanium. But okay. Yeah, it's going to burn hotter and brighter, not to mention producing molten metal droplets. So, sure, just that much more of a hazard compared to regular sparklers. Wow. This is a lot more fun than a, uh, than a, a sparkler you could buy nowadays, that's for sure. But, yeah. Making it it does drop a lot of hot sparks. Huh. You're going to need to get out a hot work permit if we're going to use anything like that in a nuclear plant. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. I know these used to be popular at weddings. Oh, yeah. I bet, I bet during the exit, the bride and groom just get pelted with molten sparks. Because why not? I probably shouldn't breathe that. Who knows what they put in these things. 
Oh my. I'm going to compare this silver sparkler to one of the uh, the modern sparklers. Now the first difference is that this old sparkler is like it's way bigger. It has a longer stick, it has way more composition, mm. and it probably burns a lot longer. So let's see if I can uh, if I can ignite these here. <laughs> these are hard to ignite. That is kind of odd. Oh my gosh, and they're very bright. Okay, so. Oh yeah. So this is the uh, this Night this one day. right here. This is the iron one, and then this is the old silver sparkler. Might as well be comparing low versus highly enriched uranium at this point. So yeah, the, the old ones are clearly a lot more fun, and they're substantially brighter. That's that's crazy. A lot more bits of metal. They, they bits do of metal uh, throw off these sparks that are uh, that are very long lived. And then this one just feels so lame in comparison. Now this one is is iron based, so the uh, that's the fuel in, in this thing. But yeah. That's uh, th that's uh, quite a difference there. Oh, and wow, the the iron one lasted longer. That's that's shocking. Even though it's like there's so much uh, more composition on the titanium one. It's interesting. Kind of like how hotter stars don't last nearly as long. I mean, at that point, you're getting into fusion instead of fission, but still. Interesting. Yeah, I can see why these were regulated out of existence. Both of these, after all, without a delayed control mechanism plus the use of questionable materials and less predictable failure modes. Yeah, I can see why they wouldn't just give these out to every consumer anymore. Thanks so much for the recommendation and thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.